Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? Perfect. That's great. I just wanted to welcome all of you uh, to this 2022 Flow Symposium named A New Reality. Um, I want to give a warm welcome uh, to our speakers and to all of you who made it here. Um, I believe the speakers are super interesting, uh, so I think you'll have a great day. Uh, so first of all about me. Uh, my name is Lewis. I'm the commissioner of the symposium committee um, and together with the committee uh, I believe we organized a super interesting symposium which I hope you'll all enjoy. Um, then um, I'm a master's data science student um, but we try to combine all three uh, faculties into this uh, so you all have some interesting topics. So first of all uh, about the speakers of today uh, first of all, we have Nathan Wildman here. Um, he'll be talking about how game streaming affects all of us. Uh, I already saw the presentation and uh, I think it's going to be super interesting. Then secondly, we have uh, Dr. George Knox. He's here as well. Uh, he will talk about Spotify, Spotify's influence uh, on us, also as a society. Um, and some remarkable stuff in there that you wouldn't think uh, <laughs> was uh, the case. Then uh, there will be an intermezzo, because uh, I believe you all need a break from time to time. So that'll be uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, we'll have a live virtual reality experience, uh, which I think will be cool for some of the people that haven't um, uh, experienced VR before. And then we have Robert Bauer. Um, he has his own company regarding virtual reality. Um, and he will talk about the future of virtual reality and how he helps uh, hospitals uh, regarding virtual reality. So that's a super interesting topic as well. Then, um, before each of the speakers, uh, we set up a short quiz to test your knowledge about the uh, subject. And hopefully then at the end of each topic, uh, you learn some stuff about it. Um, then there's also going to be Q&As, which I hope to be super interactive today. Uh, so if you could all just raise your hand, I'll uh, run up to you and uh, let you ask the question to the speaker. So uh, let's keep it interactive today. Then at the end of the symposium at around uh, five, we'll have some drinks and snacks in uh, Esplanade, uh, which I guess you're all looking forward to as well. Uh, so those are there to enjoy as well. Um, and then further, I want to give a big thank you uh, to the committee for organizing this, uh, to Studium Generale, uh, to Mind Labs for sponsoring today. Um, so let's give a warm uh, round of applause for everyone that's here today. <laughs> then let's start with the first quick quiz uh, because our first speaker will be Nathan Wildman. Um, I think you all know the concept. You can uh, scan the QR code or uh, fill out the code which I will put up on the screen right now. up. Here we go. Okay. Do we have people in here already? Yep, so people are joining, I can see. Perfect. I'll give you 10 more seconds. <laughs> to do this quickly. Okay, great. I think most people are in by now. So let's start. Gaming. Yeah, I love to play games. I used to play games when I was younger, or I have actually never played online games. I'm just curious to see your answers. Okay, so we have 35 people in here. Nice and interactive guys, thank you. 
So it seems mostly that people used to play games when they were younger. Um, and uh, some people play online games still. Um, there's one person that has never played online games. Does anyone dare to say who they are? <laughs> no, it's good that you're here. We get to, we get to learn something about that. <laughs> okay, and then the next. What kind of games did or do you play? Jennifer didn't play anything, so that's uh, all right. <laughs> Okay, race. FIFA. I see some League of Legends in there. Mostly Mario games, Nintendo games. Wings Club. Who, uh, who used to play Wings Club? Alexandra, nice. <laughs> cool. So uh, I mostly see Nintendo games, Pokemon, Mario, Zelda, and there comes some Minecraft. Uh, Call of Duty as well. GTA Online, so Spelen.nl, I know that one as well. It's just, uh, so it's a nice variety of games. Um, I think we're done for the quiz. Uh, I just want to give uh, Nathan Walman a big hand and uh, introduce him to the stage. So cool, first thing, can everybody hear me okay? Is that working? If I, I'll try not to like flail into it or well, I'll probably cough once or twice, but that's nothing I can do about it. This is yours. Thank you. Uh, no, we're going to go the other way. There we go. Here you go. Awesome. So, uh, first thing to say, thank you very much for having me. Super nice to see everybody. Nice to see a bunch of very familiar faces. Um, I hope you guys are all doing very well. Uh, so, maybe, maybe just a quick little thing about me. Uh, I work in the philosophy department. I do a bunch of random things, research-wise. I do two broad different things, though. I work in kind of logic and metaphysics, which is not what we're going to talk about today, because very few people would be excited about that. The other thing I do is I work in digital aesthetics. And in particular, I'm really interested in VR and what we're going to talk about today, what I like to call voyeur gaming which is basically watching other people play video games. I'm too lazy to even play games myself. I get other people to do it. Spend all my time watching weird people play games on YouTube. It's awesome. So what I'm really going to talk to you about is streaming. We are very familiar with it. At least most of you, I think, are students. So you will have experienced this. I have some firsthand experience doing some teaching streaming and also doing some game streaming. I was hoping to wear the same hoodie today, but my wife said I couldn't. You can see the, the wear of the, uh, of the lockdown there as well. Like, I've just, I've really gone downhill. Um, so my plan is, is pretty, pretty brief. I want to start by just kind of giving you a super fast, super compressed description of what I take streaming to be, because I think that's maybe a helpful place for us to start. A very potted history. I'm not going to talk about a lot of things. I'm not going to talk about anything about streaming music. I think George will talk to you about that. And then try and draw some history lessons from it. And that's kind of just generally thinking about streaming. The second half of the talk, the kind of more interesting one, I hope, is I'm going to pivot to think about specifically how streaming has impacted video games. And here I'm going to make three points. First, I'm going to talk about voyeur gaming, because again, I love that stuff. Second, I want to talk about streamers and, and VTubers. Let me just really quickly, do people know who, what VTubers are? Thank you. Right? Yes, I, slightly worrisome. Um, and then lastly, I want to say a little bit about games as service and why the sad face is there. So that's the plan. Um, stop me if I go too long. I've never given this presentation before, so hopefully it will be on time. Um, so place to start, what is streaming? Well, I think the first thing to note is it's not content. Right? I don't think it's, it's, it's wrong to kind of talk about streaming as a kind of content. It's a content delivery system, right? It's a way to deliver content to viewers or users or something like this. Come back to talking about potential streaming content as something special in a few moments. And I think importantly, it's worth noting that there's lots of different forms streaming can take. Basically, I think there's two that tend to happen. Correct me if I'm wrong here. There's something like a kind of on-demand, right, where you go and you find a file and you watch it. 
or there's live streaming. Anyone who's gone through lockdown with regards to education has probably gone through both of these forms. Right? What I don't think or shouldn't count as streaming is downloading. I think that's just a different kind of content delivery system. Um, we can quibble about this a little bit, but I think it's just sort of helpful to have something like a definition or working definition in the back. Right? What's nice is streaming basically has a lot of different media applications in a lot of different contexts. You see it in education. Um, you actually get education with regards to like closed captioning of lectures. YouTube does this freely, which I really love. Um, as long as you have an American accent, which is great for George and I. <laughs> You have things like this in news and politics. I think probably a really cool example of streaming is literally the live audio translations you get in like the UN. Right? One of the hardest jobs in the world, I think. And uh, something a little bit nearer and dearer to my heart, right? In education, and, or sorry, in entertainment and sports, you have, hey, like AV streaming or text or live chat. So I can sit at home and watch Villains They Lose. It's great, right? So familiar stuff. We're all kind of used to this. But where did it come from and how did it start? So here's something kind of cool. Arguably the very first so form of streaming was theatrophone. It's French, so I'm probably butchering the name. This was a super cool thing where you could call in on a telephone and listen to a, an opera being performed live. So that's awesome. And it went from 1881 to 1932. You gotta figure they probably intermitted during the war years, I'm not so sure. But like the history of streaming is kind of incredible, at least with regards to that live access to something that you're a long way away from. But the more internet-based form arguably starts in the early 90s with what's called Starworks, so close to a copyright infringement, right? Um, they provided on-demand MPEG films, full motion video. Uh, I've actually dug up on YouTube one of the clips of some of these. They were absolutely terrible. They're about this big. Um, they're about three seconds long. But hey, they did it. Right. Slightly more interesting, in 1993, you had the first full audiovisual stream of the band Severe Tire Damage. There's a cool story here. You guys probably know this, right? They literally used half of the bandwidth on the internet at the time because there just wasn't very much going. So just to simply project this little, again, terrible little postage size, postage stamp size thing of the band, uh, also not really a very good band, unfortunately. Personal taste. Um, a little bit later, 1995, ESPN gives you live audio stream of a Yankees Mariners game so we can all be bored about baseball online. 1999, you have this presidential webcast with Bill Clinton. This is, so infamously Al Gore talks about he invented the internet. This is a kind of connection where that came from. Ooh. Slightly more interesting, and we'll speed up a little bit. 2005, YouTube is founded. Um, used to have pretty substantive limits, right? Pretty, pretty substantive short restrictions. Now let me say, there's a whole bunch of technological innovation that's going on in the background here. We're gonna just skirt over it. We're thinking more, we'll call it sociologically. Right. 2006, Justin TV is founded. Who knows what Justin TV is? <laughs> cool, Justin TV, <laughs> Justin TV is Twitch. That's how it started. Here's a really, really cool thing. It actually started off as you literally would tune in and watch Justin live his life. He was one of the founders. It was not very commercially successful. Um, but it's still around and it's Twitch, right? Also, interestingly, in 2006, Amazon releases their first video on demand kind of connection, which is, I think is really neat. Um, by 2007, Netflix and Hulu began streaming services. Before that, Netflix was actually a, a DVD rental company. You'd order your DVDs, they'd mail them to you and you'd mail them back, right? Interesting for me, 2007, Right? The iPhone's released, fundamentally changes how we absorb media. More importantly, the first video Let's Play is made by Slow Beef. We'll talk about him in a few minutes. That's slightly less on the important scale. And also, with regards to games, the Chinese company Tencent probably invents or at least perfects the notion of games as service. We'll talk about a little bit about that in a few minutes. Right? 
as things kind of go on, we can see some things. So in 2011, Twitch pivots hard to do video games. Zoom is founded. FIFA Ultimate Team is introduced by, FA, uh, by EA in FIFA. By 2013, I love this. 2013 Twitch, the pivot to video games, over 45 million viewers per month. YouTube, seeing how much money Twitch is making, starts saying, hey, people should be doing live, live streaming with us too. Um, by 2016, do people know who PewDiePie is? Sorry, right? <laughs> I, yeah, well, I don't want to talk about him, but we have to. Right? He's earning more than 50 million a year basically streaming games. Right? Um, Facebook and Instagram, seeing what's happened with Twitch and, and YouTube, try and get in on that sweet, sweet money train too. Right? The last couple of years, we've seen an explosion of these services. Right? Apple TV Plus and Disney Plus launch. Skype and Zoom in 2020 explode. Hmm, I wonder why that is. What happened in 2020? Um, Ninja returns to Twitch after the Microsoft-owned Mixer fails completely and totally, despite the huge amount of money they put into it. Right. Kind of interesting, in 2021, Coda wins an Academy Award. Coda was developed by the people running Apple TV+. Plus. Um, yeah, I think, again, super potted history, just picking up on a few quick little things. So what can we learn from this little silly potted history. Two things about why streaming's risen and two kind of additional points. Here's the first one. I think streaming really explodes because of the ease of accessibility, both in terms from the viewer's perspective and from the producer's perspective, right? As the internet becomes more accessible, as more and more people get on it, you have a huge customer base if you're thinking about this from the producer's perspective. On the flip, if you're a viewer, you can sit at home and you can watch Villain Zay lose, you can watch, I don't know, Excelsior lose, you can watch PSV lose, hopefully, right? You can watch any kind of football you want. You don't even have to get up. I can watch football, American football. Sorry, I shouldn't use that term, right? There's all sorts of cool stuff that's literally just there and I don't even have to get out of my bed. Awesome. That ease of accessibility is incredible. Similarly, I think another, another kind of explanation here is cost effectiveness. It is much cheaper to just set up a webcam and start making a TV show than it is to actually like, you know, try and record a, a proper television show. Cool. I think that's a big sell. It's super easy to store them. We don't have to worry about a lot of the machinery. We don't have to worry about union actors. Hey. I think that's a, that's a, a pretty good explanation. Now the two broader points. Here's something that's I think happened in the last, yeah, we'll call them 10 years, right? There's been a huge amount of fragmentation. So we went from, let's call them, this is, this is in the US. So broadly three streaming services or something along these lines to, I'm not gonna count that, right? A lot, just tons. Arguably there's something like fatigue happening here in the market. People are getting a little bit sick, right? How many of us have gone back to torrenting shows because we can't be asked to get an Apple TV Plus thing? I freely admit, I really love Ted Lasso. I have never paid a dime for Apple TV Plus. You figure out where I got the show from, right? So eh, there's something interesting there, and I think kind of pulling people in, pushing people away. The thing that's most interesting for me, though, is something like aesthetic gains and losses. So the aesthetic gains, as I understand them, are basically just that we have a whole new massive audience and a whole new massive group of people who are making art. And that's awesome. The explosion and the fragmentation means that there's gonna be so many more people making art, and that's great. The problem is you start to see not so much consolidation, but certain kinds of of organ organizations control how things develop. So there's a particular kind of Netflix documentary style that I think is really stifling the way that lots of documentary filmmaking is, is going now. A particular kind of way that they use music, the sort of narrative that gets developed, it's really crushing a lot of different other ways to approach making documentaries. 
So that's a gain and a loss kind of brought about by what's happening here with streaming. So that's just a kind of general thing. Let's talk about what I'm actually here to talk about and streaming and video games. So as I said, I want to make three points about the relationship between video games and streaming. Here's the first one. Streaming has massively, well, maybe a better way to put this. There is no way to separate out the popularity of what I'll call voyeur gaming from streaming because they are basically the same thing. So what's voyeur gaming? Well, it's basically when you have captured gameplay sessions, often accompanied by commentary, right? These are things like, hey, what PewDiePie makes, right? There's some gameplay, not always, but sometimes a face cam. There's reactions going on, things like this. So these can arguably be traced back, well, they can be traced back to sitting on the couch with your siblings, kind of making fun of them as they play their games. But on the internet, these can probably be traced back to the Something Awful forums. In about 2004, um, Michael Sawyer, AKA Slow Beef, this is his avatar, um, makes one of the first screenshot Let's Plays of Metal Gear Solid 2, where he plays it, and he just takes, literally with his phone, pictures, not his phone, he takes an actual camera, because it's before the iPhone. He takes pictures of himself playing, posts them with some descriptions of what happens in the game on, on the Something Awful forum. By 2007, he's making video. Right? Video of himself playing the game The Immortal, which is a terrible game. Thank God he played it, because no one could actually like, get any joy out of it. It's very fun to listen to him just struggle through it. This is a screenshot from it. So what was neat is the pivot to video meant that Let's Players could, as Newman says, annotate their gameplay in real time. Of course, the next move, the really fun move, is then to introduce live streaming, right? Where instead of just a kind of prepackaged thing where there's something like post commentary, right, you as an audience member get to watch as the player is playing the game, right? And I think there's a really cool quote from Slow Beef here, I'll read it. He says, streams happen live, don't involve editing after the fact. For this reason, they tend to be a bit more exciting. It's interesting as a let's play, but seeing two people managing the same jump in Seek is exciting live. So what's he talking about with the two ones? This highlights, I think, one of the really cool things that streaming brought about. And that's One Mind Mario. Have people heard of this or seen this before? So what you have is, is a bunch of people all linked up to one version of Super Mario World and they're all playing at the same time. And every, I think it's three seconds, it switches who's actually in control. So you better be doing the same motions because otherwise Mario's gonna <laughs> It's stupidly fun to watch. <laughs> um, but I think this general idea of this kind of a, a level of interaction, aliveness, really, really fundamentally changes the way that people not engage with video games, but engage with people playing games in a way that couldn't have happened before. Right. Another kind of fun one is, um, so Smite, God, five or six years ago, played through a game called Environmental Station Alpha. It's a Metroidvania, very fun. There's a bunch of really complex puzzles. So what did he do? He streamed for five hours straight, and we all got in, and we helped together to figure out the puzzles. It felt like we were solving the game together. Right? And that's, again, driven by this sort of mix between gameplay and streaming. But there, here's the coolest kind of gameplay forum. Basically just where we get rid of the streamer altogether. Um, presumably, people have heard about Twitch plays Pokemon. Right? So the basic idea is that you see people kind of inputting things. Normally, what would be the chat? They're actually just inputting commands, and then the game executes those commands. So the audience, the people who are, you know, normally would just be interacting with the player, are the players. It's wicked cool. They actually managed to beat Pokemon Red. It took them a very long time. Um, because as you can see, Red is a little bit special when he's controlled by, at the, at the largest point when they were playing this, had over 80,000 people playing Pokemon all at the same time. Which is super cool. And that only works because of this streaming stuff. So that's the first point. Here's the second point. And this is kind of leaning off the back of the first one. And this is, hey, look, being a streamer is a legitimate profession now. Well, legitimate in some way, right? You can make money doing it, let's put it that way. 
And I think that's very interesting because a lot of these people, not all of them, but a lot of them are really interested and invested in developing their, their craft here. Right? Now the flip side to that is I think that the way streaming works tends to spur a certain kind of interaction that facilitates often problematic parasocial relationships here. And this is, again, I think, driven by the fact that there's a live response. There's a really neat video here. I've, I've linked it, but I realized you guys don't have the slides, so it doesn't really help. <laughs> there's a very fun video about the parasocial problem of streaming. I think it does this very well. That's a kind of negative side to being a streamer. Here's the positive side. And this is where we get VTubers. So VTubers, here's Nanners. Um, this is my friend Eat the Pen. Right, VTubers, instead of having themselves as the player, they use 3D models. And these 3D models often have a kind of mapping to what the person's actually doing. So if the person's like looking around or laughing, the model does too. And I think this is interesting. It's often in kayfabe, for those of you who are interested in wrestling. Right, so done in kind of character, or something like this. But it facilitates a kind of novel form of self-expression that I find really difficult to see happening unless there's this sort of streaming stuff lurking in the background. So that's the second. Here's the third, and it's unfortunately kind of negative. Um, so the third impact is about games as a service. So this is the idea that instead of just basically a game is something you sell and then you're done with it, right? As a games maker, you can get a continuing revenue model. Right? You're going to keep earning somehow, some way. There's lots of forms that games of service can take. The one that I really want to focus on is cloud gaming. So this is where you buy a copy of a game, for example, Battleforge from EA. And what they give you is effectively just a client. And the client lets you log on to some server farm somewhere out there. And that's where the game is actually run. You don't even own a copy of the game, not strictly. You own access to it. And if they ever shut that server farm down, cool, you don't get to play no more, which is exactly what happened with Battleforge. Within three years of release, it was gone. So, you know, it's still in my Steam library, but I can't do nothing with it. <laughs> right. And I think this is, again, something that's come about precisely because of streaming. It only works because you can actually play the game without it being on your machine. Okay, so I basically want to wrap up and say, hey, streaming, I think, has been both good and bad for video games. It's been interestingly, interestingly good aesthetically. I think it's been bad for the industry and maybe potentially also bad aesthetically. There's a kind of connection here to that Netflix documentary thing. But yeah, that's the stuff I really wanted to say. I have some further questions if you want to talk about them or consider them, but that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nathan Wildman. Uh, wasn't that a super interesting talk? Uh, I think it was. Um, I, I learned some stuff that I didn't know. Uh, I didn't uh, even know that Justin TV was the first uh, kind of... Uh, uh, Twitch, yeah. Yeah, kind of Twitch in the first hand, and uh, also a, a kind of live reality TV because he was streaming himself. That's kind of weird. Um, so for the Q&A, we have... Uh, room for a few questions. Who would like to ask Nathan a question? Anyone want to put their hand up? I'm going to say, come right to talk you. about video games too, that's fine, you know. <laughs> um, I was wondering how you, uh, how you feel about videos that analyze live streams after the fact that maybe take, for example, what I've watched myself. I don't really watch any live streams, but I've watched a analysis of speedrun live streams where after the fact they look back on several years of history of this is how the speedrunning world has developed of Mario Kart and they use the live stream as an example and they show the live reactions but it's someone else it's not the actual streamer and I feel like that's another layer of removal for me as the audience from the actual content itself but it also adds another layer of value because there's the analysis and the depth I was wondering how you view that. Yeah, I entirely agree with you. I think you're exactly right to point out that there's this kind of weird distance from the game, um, but there's, there's something really cool and interesting there about the analysis. So one of the things, actually, if I can go back, 
So one of the things I think is really interesting about Voyeur Gaming, and it comes through, I think, also in what you're talking about, is you might think there's a problem with engaging with games only in this kind of voyeuristic way. So put really cheaply, you might think games are essentially interactive, right? In order to engage with them properly, you have to play. But if the way you're engaging with games is by watching someone else play, you're doing it wrong. It's a bit like uh, I pay somebody to go look at a painting, and then they come back and give me a report about it. Not quite the same, but not terribly far off. I think there's something actually valuable and aesthetically distinctive in that kind of remove. So yeah, I, I think there's something really interesting there. I've got to think about it a little more, exactly how to tease out what's really cool there, but I'm, I'm definitely on your side. Thank you for the question and the uh, interesting answer. Is there one more question? Um, we have room for one more question. Yep. Hi, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, sometimes I feel like uh, there are more and more games being developed that are meant as streaming games first yeah. and ga uh, playing games second. Yes. Um, so how do you view this and how do you view like the, the way that games remain a unique medium uh, in, the, in the general media playing field? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, good. I didn't mention that kind of stuff mostly because I was trying to go fast and, and made a mistake. But I think, just to go back to this, yeah, I think one thing to mention is just how massively this kind of stuff has impacted the game industry, right? So you have uh, game companies paying streamers to, to basically hype their games. You have built into the PS4 and the PS5 controller, the kind of like, let's do the share button. It's also on the, I, I think it's in the Switch too. I don't, I don't have a Switch, but. Um, yeah, th there's something weird there. And I, I'm not sure it's necessarily impeding games as a distinct kind of medium or getting in the way of their aesthetic development. Mostly because I think there's, there's a sufficient kind of indie stuff going on, like an indie uh, industry, that's the wrong word, but that's the best I can come up with, to kind of keep it real. I do worry about how this might impact some AAA games. And I, especially when we tie that with this stuff. I think there's just a big worry that, that as, as companies start to focus more and more on like, hey, let's, let's get a bunch of people like kind of engaging with tweets from our game. Let's make sure people don't actually own the game. I, I get hackles start getting raised there. So yeah, it's a cool question. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Then let's give a round of applause to Nathan Waldman for his great presentation. And we hope to hear more from you during the panel discussion. Then let's go through to where we left. Um, next of all, we're gonna go do a quick quiz before we introduce Dr. George North Knox to the stage, who will talk about Spotify's influence. If you could all uh, scan the code and otherwise, I will open it right here. Uh, perfect, got it working again. So we'll just wait for the participants to increase. Seems like uh, some phone's batteries might have died. Okay, I hope most people are in now. I see one more person trying to take a photo of the QR code. Maybe they can join a little later. So, first of all, do you use Spotify? Yes, I use another music streaming platform. Well, they, they are there, but uh, yeah. And I don't listen to music. 
I was kind of expecting this answer, but it's still kind of crazy to see that uh, Spotify has such a big mi uh, majority of the uh, music streaming market. Uh, who doesn't listen to music? I'm quite curious. Okay. Well, good that you're here. I think you'll learn something about Spotify and music streaming. Uh, I'm not here to shill Spotify in any way, so uh, it's just uh, my independent opinion. Um, next question. What genre of music do you listen to? Okay, hip hop is massive in the screen. <laughs> Everything, almost anything. There's some specific genres, but there's also some overlapping genres like Dutch music that can be rock, pop, indie, jazz, or whatever. <laughs> Eurovision music, <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> Techno, ska, I, I'm, I'm not even really aware of ska music. I, is it something big? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of it. <laughs> Metal, there's, there's a lot of different genres up here, so it's cool to see such a diverse group of people. Then I would like to end the quiz and welcome on stage Dr. George Knox. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is George Knox. I'm an associate professor in the marketing department at Tilburg University. Um, yeah, I saw the sea shanties thing. I was uh, just telling Nathan, my six-year-old son is totally into sea shanties. So we have the sea shanty playlist on Spotify. Uh, I've heard a lot of those shanties many, many times. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Spotify's um, influence, and this is some research that I've done, and some of which is ongoing. Let me first tell you a little bit about myself, and this also relates a bit to Spotify. So I'm from Philadelphia in the US, and in 2006, I got my PhD, and my first job um, after graduating was in Tilburg. So I uh, packed up all my stuff, I put all my CDs in boxes and whatnot, and I shipped them over to Tilburg. And um, yeah, I uh, you know, worked here for five years. And then I decided that I wanted to go back to Philadelphia for a little bit. So I accepted a job back in Philadelphia in 2011. And once again, I took all my CDs and I put them in boxes and I shipped them back to Philadelphia. And then in 2013, I came back to Tilburg. And you know, uh, instead of shipping my uh, you know stuff uh, that just seemed ridiculous, Spotify now had uh, uh, had uh, started, and so it just made a whole lot more sense to me um, instead of putting all this stuff in boxes and having it shipped there to um, you know to join Spotify and just have all of my music sort of in the cloud. And it was very obvious to me as somebody who had made this transatlantic journey. Um, that there are some drawbacks of ownership. So that sort of streaming where, uh, you know, uh, where you don't own the physical thing, that that's actually sort of nice sometimes, that there's a drawback at least for having possession, so physical possession of these goods. Um, so Spotify, um, you know, you can think of it as sort of an all-you-can-eat buffet of music that lives in the cloud. And um, some quick facts that I got about this uh, recently is um, that the number of subscribers is quite uh, is 182 million. So it's an enormous. So a lot of people, like what was it, almost 100% of people here are on Spotify. There are 82 million tracks that are available. Um, it's available in 183 markets. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's um, grown tremendously. Um, and it's a very widely used service. Um, yeah. A brief history of the music industry. Um, so the music industry basically, um, in the beginning of the 2000s, um, took a dive, uh, did quite uh, badly. So I don't know if anyone here used Napster. Uh, yes, Nathan. <laughs> I figured you to be the type. Uh, <laughs> 
yeah, so, so you know, um, illegal downloads and stuff like that, that was sort of the, that was, um, was one of the reasons that at least people were, were um, buying fewer and fewer CDs. So that's this sort of, that would be in this sort of red part down here. And yeah, the industry, you know, revenues, so in about 2008, Spotify uh, started. And you can sort of see that streaming, the blue part here, basically um, is now the majority of uh, music revenues. So streaming is sort of the dominant business model right now, at least in music. And it's credited with saving the music industry. So it's important, since it's so ubiquitous, to understand what effect that has on our listening behavior. And so that's the, what I'm going to talk to you about. What is, our, you know, what is Spotify's influence on us as listeners? Um, so um, we have some research, and I want to tell you about it. Um, and so that looks at how Spotify influences the total amount of music that we listen to, what type of music we listen to, what new music we discover, so that's new to us. And lastly, um, whether it makes us more similar or more different to others in terms of what we listen to. So, um, for example, we may all discover more new music on Spotify, but is it the same new music that we're all listening to, or are we sort of discovering new music that's more different? Might be a little bit worried, for example, if we're all discovering the same new music that Spotify is promoting, and so, uh, you know, we might be worried that it becomes like just a big radio station that's just promoting more and more stuff that we're all listening to. So we want to check that out. That's sort of the, the last thing. Um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the method behind this, because I think this is sort of interesting, and it has to do with big data. Um, we got uh, data on what people listen to and what platform they use to listen to it with um, from a company called Last FM. not actually... When I say a company, I mean, this is just a scrolling website that would say, um, you know, this user is listening to this sort of track on Spotify. And uh, it could be that they were listening to it, for example, on iTunes or something else. This would, like, record that. And we, would con we sort of monitored this uh, continuously um, for a number, of, a number of users. And over time, that gave us this sort of panel of users and we could see what they were listening to and on what platform. So we could see, for example, what happens when somebody who wasn't on Spotify all of a sudden joined Spotify. And um, yeah, so um, one, when, I, when I talk about, so, so one sort of method here that, that's, um, that's sort of uh, maybe interesting to talk about too is that it's a bit of using big data as a tool to an approximate an experiment. If I wanted to see what Spotify's influence is, if I want to see what the causal effect of Spotify is on something, like listening behavior, um, I would, uh, I'd be worried that if I just look at users who, or people who have Spotify and people who aren't Spotify members, the whatever one person or something that, that isn't uh, there, that that one person is just very different than the other 99. Um, and so that they're really not equivalent. The person who doesn't join because they themselves chose not to join maybe doesn't like music as much. And so that sort of invalidates this um, comparison when we want to say that, you know, we want to, the people that join Spotify and the people that don't join Spotify, we want them to be as equivalent as possible except for the fact that one group joined and another group didn't. And so we, we'd, we'd be worried that these two groups are not equivalent because people make their own choices. Well, one thing is with big data, so, so well, let me step back. So an ideal experiment would be, you know, I, I randomly assign half of this room to join Spotify and the other half to not join Spotify. And, you know, by sort of the logic of randomization and whatnot, you know, this, these two groups would be equivalent, except for the fact that one joins Spotify and the others doesn't. So if I compare the outcomes, your listening behavior, then I'd be able to say that the difference in your listening behavior is due to that Spotify and not due to some other factors. We don't have that uh, experimental data, but what we, do, what we do is we take, we use big data sort of as an approximation here. We sort of say, well, in our data, we see so many people, we can basically look at all of these people who adopted Spotify and find their sort of data twin. Find all of the people who are very close uh, to, to the people who adopted Spotify, except for the fact that they didn't. So in other words, they're from the same, uh, they're from the same country, they have roughly the same age, they listen to the same amount of music, 
again, so that we're making an apples to apples comparison here. And so that when we look at the difference, we can, um, we can say that that difference in listening behavior is due to Spotify and not due to some other um, factor. So that was a bit of an aside uh, for, for the methods. Let me tell you about the results. So I said uh, I would tell you about Spotify's influence on sort of four different things. So the first is that the overall amount of stuff that we listen to increases when we join Spotify. Basically, um, in uh, the long term, so uh, even six months after joining, people are still uh, listening to about 50% more music. That translates roughly in our sample to something like 20 more minutes per day. Um, so they're like long-term effects of, of people listening to more stuff. And so if you think about why that may be, very simply, um, if we compare, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, no, we only had access to Spotify because Spotify is just so, so we had too few people from, for example, Deezer to make any valid comparisons. So in our, in our sample from, yeah, like 2016, 2015, Spotify was it, basically, in, in, in what we had. Um, but that's a good question to see, like, yeah, to, there may be, indeed, differences um, across these uh, different platforms. Um, that are important. Um, so um, yeah, so they listen. To, you listen to more music, and one sort of basic thing here is that yeah, when you, for example, if you're comparing iTunes and Spotify, you know, variety is costly in the ownership model and sort of the iTunes model. To buy a song is 99 cents. On Spotify, it's free. So if you think of just the cost of listening or the cost of uh, listening to more variety um, on uh, on Spotify, that's zero or very close to zero. Um, and so you would expect that people listen to more music because the cost of it has been uh, has gone down. So that sort of makes sense that you know once people join Spotify, they listen to more music overall. Um, what happens to the stuff? Uh, like uh, so they listen to more music, but like what what happens to the types of music that they listen to? Um, so we find that people listen to more variety, which is really nice. So they increase the, the number of artists the, that they listen to each week and also the amount of uh, new songs that they listen to each week. Uh, so the breadth of variety um, increases. And we also can sort of characterize it by how much, um, like for example, I mean, uh, it's just a, a fact of, of, uh, of uh, uh, music industry that they're superstars and then, you know, that have lots and lots of, um, that are extremely popular and listened to by everyone. Think of like Taylor Swift and, you know, others who are almost never listened to. So we find also in our, uh, that people um, listen to fewer superstars. So fewer artists from like the top 100 or top 500 um, in our sample. And even, um, uh, even sort of maybe more interesting is that they're, they concentrate their le listening less. So even so, users who join Spotify, they also um, they also sort of like spread their listening out to a wider set of artists. And they don't concentrate their listen their their listening all on just like one song or one artist. They do that. They sort of spread it out more. So that's sort of interesting. So variety increases and it sort of fragments. It 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 uh, is spread out over a larger set of artists and songs. Because we have this data that tracks what people listen to, we can see um, when people find new stuff, stuff that they hadn't heard before. So um, one aspect here is about discovery. So how, do, you know, how does joining Spotify affect the number of new songs and new artists that you listen to? Well, sort of no big surprise here because the cost of, of listening to stuff goes to zero when you join Spotify. It's just 10 euros a month. You can listen to however uh, much music you want to people um, listen to more new artists and new songs. So uh, the story sort of, there's a bit of a sort of complication with this story though, is that when you, when the cost of sort of, uh, you know, when, when the cost of listening goes to zero, you don't have, you know, you're sort of caught, you know, if you don't know anything about a song or, or an artist, you know, you don't have to think that much about whether you want to hear them or not. 
Your only uh, loss is sort of the loss of time that you have in listening to it. So actually, people discover more music, but most of that music is only listened to once. So the cost of experimentation also you know, goes down. And so we experiment more, and most of those experiments are bad. And so indeed, that's what we find. But sort of the, the flip side of that is, if you look at the stuff that's listened to the most after people join Spotify, that is listened to even more. So their top new discoveries are even better than they were before people joined Spotify. So people discover more music. Most of it is sort of bad. But the best new discoveries are better on Spotify than not on Spotify. Last thing I want to tell you is, does it make us more similar or different to each other? Um, and so um, this is a bit what I was saying before. Um, yeah, so we, we discover new music on Spotify, which is what I just told you. Um, you know, it might be problematic if we're all discovering the same new thing. And, you know, Spotify, of course, has these playlists, um, some of which are personalized, so in theory different for, for everyone, but some of them, of course, are the same. And one, of the, one example of that is today's top hits, which has about 31 million followers. So that's, that playlist is the same for everyone, right? So we might be worried that the new songs that we're discovering are being, you know, are all the same new songs that come from like this playlist like this. So it's sort of like a radio station on steroids that has a massive uh, uh, user base or listener base. So yeah, you know, a bit further, you know, at the moment, um, you know, Spotify is sort of, uh, you know, is, is saying that if you, um, if, if you agree uh, if, if it takes some of your royalties, it'll help promote your songs and put them on these playlists. And that's a bit of a, a, of a, a controversy at the moment. So you can, like, a, like radio stations used to, you can sort of pay a little bit on the radio station so that it puts your record on. And so the same thing is sort of happening in the digital era. So again, we might be worried that this is sort of taking place. Um, so... Uh, so the first, at first glance, when people join Spotify, we find that um, they become more similar in terms of what they listen to. In other words, that people, the, yeah, the, the stuff that we listen to looks more similar. But on um, closer inspection, uh, it's not so bad. It turns out that because when somebody is a Spotify user, they increase the number of things that they listen to, the likelihood that any two users um, share a song increases just because we're listening to more things overall. So in other words, if similarity goes up just because I'm listening to more things overall, that's not so bad. I mean, people are listening to more things. That's OK. They're, they're um, you know, you can think about this in terms of welfare. That's probably good for them. Um, so after correct, so in other words, after correcting for this, the fact that people are listening to more stuff, actually, what we find is that, um, uh, that people are actually getting a little bit further apart. Not much, but slightly further apart. So what looks to be bad in the beginning, you know, the fact that people are becoming more similar, is really sort of taken away once you account for the fact that just people are listening to more music overall when they uh, join Spotify. So again, I, I think of that as not being sort of a bad thing for consumers, but actually a good thing. So people are listening to more music that's valued, you know, where the cost of listening is at zero. They're listening to more things. So the fact that we're more similar to each other actually isn't really that bad in the end. Um, so um, yeah, so the conclusion here is, um, yeah, so, so what does what is Spotify's influence? So we listen to more music overall. Um, we listen to more variety fewer superstars and personal favorites, so we sort of fragment our listening across a wider array of um, artists and songs. We discover more new music, most of which is not good, um, but the best of which is better than it was before Spotify. And in the end, um, after accounting for, for listening more overall, we're actually uh, more different, not more similar uh, than before joining. So that's, um, those are the findings from, from our, our research into this. Um, how am I doing on time? OK, well, five minutes. I, um, 
I'm happy to uh, take questions. Some interesting stuff. I mean, we can leave this for later, but you know, uh, you know, streaming is of course changing a lot, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know some projects that I'm sort of working on at the moment or, or interested in working on are, are these types of things. So like, how do artists get discovered on Spotify? They have to like pitch their music to get onto like an appropriate playlist. Um, yeah, and, and you know, actually this is a little bit like what Nathan was talking about. Are we sort of aesthetically limited by the sort of Spotify song? You know, there's, there are also criticisms on Spotify that, um, you know, the chorus has to come in at 30 seconds. All of these songs sound alike, just like all of these Netflix documentaries maybe are a little bit alike. So, um, yeah, that's sort of an interesting idea of how the platform, which is so powerful, how that shapes the music that's being created. So that's one sort of area of, of research. And another weird thing that's sort of come up here is that um, recently um, hedge funds have invested in um, the rights of songs. So they've bought up the catalogs of uh, like Bob Dylan, um, Taylor Swift, and others. So when you're listening to a song on Spotify, actually the royalty that you, you know that you're uh, is going uh, probably to a hedge fund. Um, instead of the artist, at least for some of these. And so that's sort of interesting. So what, what is, uh, you know, um, yeah, so what, what does that sort of mean for, um, uh, for, for music and for, and, for, uh, and for consumers? So, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, if there are any, I, I'm happy to end right now. Um, if there are any questions, I'm also happy to... Uh, answer them. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let's give a hand to Dr. George Knox. Thank you. We can just go to the next slide. I think we do have room for a question if there is a burning question. I'm glad that there's Spotify because I have like 80,000 listening minutes and I'd be broke if there was only iTunes. So we have a question here in the back. So uh, I was wondering, considering that you said that everyone's listening goes up using Spotify, what do you think about listening fatigue w with Spotify? Because uh, like a lot of people, I feel like are experiencing it, don't know what to listen to anymore because like everything, like listening to so many things that you get fatigued for choosing your music, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, so you're saying, what do people listen to now? What, what do you? Sorry, I I'm feel like people get fatigued over choosing their music because they're oh so fatigued. Much yeah, fa fatigued. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, um, so that's that's where recommender systems come in. Well, so so <laughs> the the number of yeah. So so with like, uh, you know, with 84 whatever it was million tracks, there's no way that anyone 82 million. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it, you know, no one knows all of these tracks. And so we really rely on things like recommender systems to try to, like, guide us to, um, to stuff that we'll like. But that's a big if, right? I mean, are recommenders, I mean, re are they good or not? You know, uh, maybe they push us in, in certain directions. Um, yeah, so, so um, there's more access. So, I mean, so, so. It's nice that all these tracks are available and more people can create, more artists can connect with listeners everywhere. And that's a good thing. But on the other hand, they may not get discovered because they never end up on the recommender list or whatever, or they're not, and so that's not good. And so we have to sort of think of those, those, those two different things. And so yeah, so choice overload and stuff like that, that that's indeed something um, that's uh, a problem. Um, yeah, maybe. That's thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. George Knox. Uh, thank you for the question. Let's give one round of applause again to uh, Dr. George Knox. Here we are again. I see six people are in already. You're all quick. Let's just wait for all the people to be in again. Is everyone in? <laughs> Let's wait for a few more, see more people coming in. Oh, 
All right. The first question. Have you ever used virtual reality? Maybe just now? <laughs> Maybe in 2017? Maybe way before that? Okay, so almost everyone just used uh, virtual reality. Is that just here? Or did you use it before already? Before, here, anyone else? Before as well? Okay, cool. Okay, so for a definition, we just had virtual reality. Then the next question is extended reality. Is anyone uh, aware what extended reality means and what do you think it is? I'm curious to see. Mixing realities, okay. No idea. VR with it, okay. So there's a lot of ideas. Also a lot of no ideas. Other senses included. Also with smells and touch. Okay, I think we're not quite there yet, but uh, let's hope we get there in the future. Meta, layers on top of physical, mixing realities. Cool. I think um, if our third speaker uh, is almost ready, um, he'll explain uh, what extended reality means and uh, talk a bit more about virtual reality. Let's welcome our uh, third speaker and give a round of applause. Thanks a lot, Louis, uh, for the uh, for the kind uh, kind introduction. And somewhere in this presentation, I will uh, I will touch upon the topic of uh, of extended reality and give you uh, a small uh, definition around that. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, ask you some questions. And uh, um, and the first one is to ask you to stand up if you have a passion for extended reality. It can be VR, AR, everything around these realities. If you've done something with it. Okay, okay, let's see. And now, or start standing, if you find that accessible healthcare is important. <laughs> okay. Quite obvious, quite obvious. Let's see. And keep standing if you work in healthcare. No one? All right. Okay. Um, based on that, I think our healthcare system is facing an incredible infarction. So what we see in healthcare is actually that demand is going up like crazy. We're all getting way older and older. That's because our healthcare system is getting way better. We can cure people who years ago we couldn't cure anymore. But people also get chronically ill. So even they, we all live longer. We also live longer with more diseases. But we also see actually supply valves, so people actually want to work in healthcare or actually work in healthcare is actually going down. You saw it here in the audience as well. Pff, no one works actually in healthcare. And if kind of like this current, um, this current uh, uh, development is, is continuing, in 2040, one in four people needs to work in healthcare um, to actually to uh, cope with the demand that is there for healthcare. So um, quite a big group uh, here actually needs to shift their career and actually start working, uh, working in healthcare if we don't change anything. And actually what we need in healthcare um, is actually a completely disruptive, different way of working. And for that, we actually need more young and bright entrepreneurs. So people who actually were just standing and say, hey, I have, for example, a passion, in, uh, in, uh, a passion for extended reality or maybe you have any other, uh, other technologies. I would actually advise you to have a look at working in healthcare. Um, you also, also need to be a little bit crazy because um, what we actually need in healthcare is more and more people working with technologies like extended reality, and that's basically an umbrella term for virtual reality. So that's what we what we see there: augmented reality, mixed reality. So just it's just a, a small definition. But we need more people who, like you, young bright minds, who are going to work in healthcare with, for example, a technology like extended reality. Because with these new kinds of technologies, we can actually cope with this whole infarction that we're now facing in healthcare. Uh, because with technology, we can actually disrupt the way of 
how we work in healthcare. And we can actually digital, digitalize um, certain, way of, uh, certain ways of working. And today, um, I hope I can inspire you a little bit to also, even though you don't have the ambition to become a doctor or a nurse, you can still become active in healthcare. For example, with working like cool tech, uh, like we're doing with Singapore Medical, with working with extended reality in healthcare. So basically, what uh, what we have uh, what we have done over the last uh, over the last years, uh, we've developed a uh, extended reality app store. You can basically see it as the Netflix for extended reality in healthcare, where we integrate worldwide the best XR apps that are there, all in one uh, one centralized uh, centralized app store. And we mostly see now a lot of use cases for extended reality in pain management and, medic and medication reduction, education and training of, uh, of healthcare staff, and using XR for rehabilitation. And uh, today I will show you a few examples of these uh, uh, in these three, uh, the three pillars of how XR is actually in these days already being used in healthcare and how we can actually, how it will look in the, in the future as well. Uh, and hopefully through that, um, that everyone starts realizing that of course, I was actually just talking to you and said, hey, these new kind of technologies always start in gaming and entertainment, and that's usually what people focus on. But it's actually, there's a huge need for working with these kinds of technologies, but also with artificial intelligence and with big data um, in quite old-fashioned industries like, uh, like healthcare. So how do we use, for example, virtual reality for pain and medication reduction? Um, our brain is pretty fascinating. So, um, and sometimes it can be brilliant, sometimes it can be pretty stupid. Um, what we, for example, see, and uh, we see a lot of children who are facing, actually also adults, I think one third of adults have a, a sincere fear of needles. Um, but actually, especially in healthcare, you see certain children, for example, in the uh, Princess Maxima Centrum for Pediatric Oncology, Child Cancer, uh, where children day after day and week after week and month after month need to get certain needle, uh, needle treatments, can be IV placements, can be blood sampling. And um, some of them are actually completely traumatized by this, and it causes them fear, and they get super anxious for already this whole uh, this whole moment leading up to that. And um, now we are working with uh, almost 70% of all pediatric departments in the Netherlands, and actually also outside uh, in some other European countries, where VR is being used to distract patients, distract children, but also up to adults, and give them actually a pleasant experience in virtual reality that can be swimming with dolphins, playing a game. Uh, having a nice relaxation exercise on a tropical beach. And this immersiveness of virtual reality, being in this virtual world, 360 degrees around you, actually tricks your brain so much and draws so much of the cognitive ability of your brain that your capacity to experience pain and anxiety goes down. And what we've seen in, uh, in study, we just finished a scientific study in Denmark, is that the pain threshold, so how well you're able to handle pain, uh, doubled with our VR headset with a group of 80, uh, of 80 children. So those kids were two times as able, better able to handle pain with a VR headset because they were so well, uh, well distracted. And that actually means that uh, we see an opportunity for decreasing medication because we give pain medication uh, because people experience pain. But if they are two times better able to handle their pain, um, if they experience less pain, we can actually decrease their medication. So this is an example of, it was a really... Uh, it's an older, uh, older, uh, older man. I think he was uh, he was in his 70s, um, coming for thorax surgery. So it's a long, uh, long surgery, and he was actually too weak to undergo the surgery under uh, under general uh, general anesthetic, so full narcosis. And then, um, together with the thorax surgeon, we actually they performed the surgery under local anesthesia, so just the local region. He got his pain medicine, and in combination with the VR headset, and there was enough for this person to actually undergo the surgery. So instead of a way longer time in the hospital, because from full narcosis, you need to have a way longer recovery period, uh, way more people from the hospital need to be involved. The procedure was shorter, less pain medication, less time for this person in, uh, in the hospital, and less side effects, just to a VR headset with some software on it. And um, it's also seen in studies where you actually see that um, this was a study where they gave um, uh, heat stimuli to adults, um, and uh, they measured what it did in your brain if you had VR or you didn't have VR. The yellow parts of your brain are the parts in your brain where you experience pain. And what they saw, giving this, this heat stimuli to adults, that the VR group, those uh, areas in the brain were way less active, and other parts of the brain were more active, like orientation in this virtual, uh, in this virtual world. Um, 
And in the non-VR group, actually the areas in the brain where they experience pain, they were way more active. So you really see this shift in your cognitive, uh, uh, in your cognitive attention when using VR, actually in this case for pain, anxiety, and stress reduction. Some other use cases, improved rehabilitation. So um, these kinds of VR headsets, you put them on and you can watch a video, you can look a bit around, there's some basic interaction. There's actually also VR headsets like uh, the man is holding here with two, uh, two controllers. Nowadays you also just have hand tracking, where you can actually physically move around in a virtual, uh, in a virtual space. If you think, so roughly two years back, uh, first COVID wave, we instantly saw that people who had COVID had a tremendous recovery period. People who were coming from the uh, intensive care unit were completely traumatized. Uh, they, they were almost off this, uh, this world, something we, we, we didn't see before with such infectious diseases. Um, so together with the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, we set up a study to help a group of uh, patients with home rehabilitation in virtual reality. So it's a group of 50 patients who got a VR set in ho at home um, with if video shows, yes, um, with a whole set of physical movement exercises that they needed to do each uh, each day, uh, specifically focused on on general body uh, body movement of all kinds of different difficulty levels to really tailor it to this uh, this patient uh, uh, this patient rehabilitation path. Uh, mental relaxation exercises to cope with their stress and cognitive exercises to really recover the cognitive ability of their brain after being on the intensive care unit. Um, and what they really saw is that this gamified way of rehabilitation, instead of general, I know, doing your lunges or your squats uh, uh, for your rehabilitation process, we actually gamified all these, uh, all, these, uh, all these rehabilitation exercises. It was for patients way more fun. They had a way more structure in the rehabilitation because they just put on their VR headset and their set of rehabilitation exercises was there. And this physiotherapy could also monitor on the distance of how, how their patients were doing. So in this way, um, we saw that almost it was 80% uh, of, uh, of the patients really enjoyed this, uh, this way of, uh, of rehabilitation. Uh, the majority of physiotherapists really said they had significantly less contact moments with their patients because, hey, Things were going well, they were just at home doing the rehab, I didn't need to see them in my practice. Um, so we save a lot of travel time as well and contact moments. Um, so we really made a model where people can at home rehabilitate with, uh, uh, with virtual reality. Um, papers are being published at, uh, um, at, uh, at the moment and we're now in the process of setting up a new trial with, uh, with almost 250 patients to really way better measure the effectiveness of this way of rehabilitating uh, in comparison with, uh, with traditional physiotherapy. And finally, um, improved training and uh, uh, training and education. Um, the amazing thing of, uh, of these new types of reality is that not depending on time or place, you can actually train people. So with VR, uh, you can people in a, put people in a completely simulated environment and let them go through all kinds of trainings. Well, if you now look at nursing or doctor education, you really see that people either learn in such an audience, watching at, uh, watching at a lecture and read some stuff in the book, or they need to do it on the job. And on the job, there's always a huge bottleneck because there's an operating theater, it's already full of surgeons or one surgeon and nurses, so maybe one or two people can join that operating theater. But with these um, extended reality technologies, we can actually let people be in that operating theater without actually being there or make a simulation actually from it and they can after being there one time on the job, they can do it over and over and over and over um, in their simulated environment. Because what we always also saw from studies, for example, this, uh, you, see, you see it's fake, 100%, uh, and this technology needs to develop. But as a surgeon, the moment you see a patient with blood coming out of their leg, you forget it's fake, you, you go into your, your adrenaline mode and you start doing your, uh, uh, your, uh, your work. And that is basically the same with maybe uh, if you have a fear of spiders or if you have a fear of heights, if you think about it, you already start panicking. So even a fake image in your head already triggers a certain type of anxiety. And that is actually the same what we can do with simulated environments in virtual or, uh, or augmented reality. You can actually, not depending on time or place, actually train and educate people. Um, and this is going, going further and further. So this, for example, this is a Dutch company. Who, uh, uh, who developed uh, a sense glove, which is a haptic feedback glove, which actually now in VR you have controllers or you have just, yeah, it's just air. But with these haptic feedback gloves, you can actually grab uh, virtual objects that give 
haptic feedback to your um, um, actually haptic feedback to your uh, to your hands. So you can actually grab a drilling machine, uh, and it feels actually like you're holding this drilling machine in virtual reality. So it's pretty cool how this technology is developing uh, developing over time. And a small look into the future um, where this might be uh, this might be uh, this might be going. Uh, there was a pretty cool. Uh, Oh, the sound is not working, but it doesn't really matter. Um, pretty cool example of a small, uh, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a commercial, it's a bit uh, uh, American over-exaggerated, um, but where this guy is at his uh, daughter's wedding and he gets, uh, it's a high-end surgeon, and he's actually doing this from completely uh, remotely. I hope I never get, uh, I'm being, uh, being an, uh, in, uh, on the surgery from someone who maybe had a glass of champagne at his daughter's wedding and uh, steps out for a moment, so, I'm not sure if this is the best, uh, the best example, but in the end, it does actually show what is, uh, what is possible with this technology. Um, and also with the, um, with the realization that um, this type of headset that we currently have is basically comparable with the first generation of smartphone that's out there. So back then, super cool, this first iPhone, and uh, wow, you're completely amazed by it. If you would use it now, it would be useless. Um, not connected to any app store anymore, not updated. Um, but back then it was super cool, and that is kind of like where we're currently at. The current generation of headset is this first smartphone, and there's still so much more development uh, development coming that will enable so much more uh, so much more possibilities. And having actually remote surgery will definitely become uh, a thing in combination with all kinds of other technologies like 5G and uh, all kinds of interconnectivity, but also with extended reality. And I really hope to. Um, inspire you guys a bit that with these kinds of technologies, you can actually also make an impact in healthcare. It's not only about gaming and entertainment, um, but there's actually also a new reality in, uh, in healthcare. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, to me, that's very interesting, uh, also because you use it as uh, training on the job, for example. Uh, maybe have time for one short question. Um, and then we'll head over to the panel discussion. Do you have a question? You haven't had the turn yet. Let me walk to you. Um, I wanted to ask, how does using VR compare to using other types of games to distract or uh, motivate people to move? Yeah, so actually the study that I just uh, quoted, we did in Denmark with the pain threshold with children. The, the setup was um, the control group was talking to, uh, talking to the kids, some small talk. They used uh, a tablet with a video for distraction for the kid, a 360 video in the VR headset, and an interactive game in the VR headset. And um, um, uh, also the tablet also had a significant effect, uh, but the 360 video was an even higher uh, effect, and the interactive game was even higher. So that is usually what you see. Um, in this area is all types of distraction work. Uh, every, uh, there are probably not many parents here, but uh, if you have kids, distraction is the way. Uh, if your kid falls, you give a candy or you wave. And you distract people and then uh, you, uh, your brain gets less. So every type of distraction works, but you definitely see that this immersiveness of virtual reality really triggers something else in your, in your brain than watching something, on, for example, on a tablet. Perfect, thank you. Then um, I'll invite you uh, to take place on the stage as well as uh, Dr. George Knox and Nathan Wildman. Um, let's give another round of applause for Robert. Thank you very much. Um, you can just stand by the blocks here um, and I'll uh, propose a few statements um, in which you can answer if you feel uh, that you have an opinion about it. Um, of course, the audience can join as well. If you feel that you have a strong opinion about something, um, just raise your hand. I'll be looking into the audience uh, and hand you the microphone. So the first question is, could constantly living in virtual worlds change our perception of our life? Is this something that you already notice yourself or for others around you? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go, because this is, this is right up my alley. Uh, microphone working OK? Yeah. Cool, OK. So first thing to say, everybody familiar with, uh, with uh, Robert Nozick? Probably not. So he has a really famous thought experiment called the experience machine, which is like, hey, cool. Imagine that basically 
next year, instead of living your life, what we're going to do is we're going to plug you into a machine that's basically just like the holodeck from uh, Next Generation of Star Trek, which I realize is probably older than many of you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, in the experience machine, you can have whatever kinds of experiences you want, and your life's going to be exactly like you want it. You're going to feel like it's real life. When you come out of it, though, you're going to basically just think, hey, you lived through all of this stuff. Nozick asks, like, who would want to actually plug into the machine? And he thinks pretty much nobody would. Um, no matter how cool the experiences are, he thinks they wouldn't quite live up to the right thing. I think it's an interesting kind of version of this, this thought experiment. I actually kind of disagree with Nozick, um, because things like VR allow for a sort of interactivity that maybe the experience machine as it's set out is. But I don't know, there's a flip to it too, and this kind of comes back to something you were talking about. With um, I, I always ask this to digital aesthetics. Imagine you're going to get on a plane. And the, the only pilot on the plane has been trained in the absolute best possible VR system that's ever been developed. Again, only pilot on the plane. Would you feel comfortable on the plane? Hmm. <laughs> that, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, just like uh, considering that um, in a podcast um, with Lex Friedman, Mark Zuckerberg talks about the avatar effect. Uh, which means that humans will feel more comfortable in the virtual world than the real world. Maybe, Robert, you can uh, allude on this. Th would you feel that way? Um, always, when, like my, my first reaction would be, ah, probably no, but then I think back at this moment, I still realized when I had my, my Blackberry the, the, with the physical keyboard, I said, and then that were the first touch screen smartphones come out and I said now I will okay it's cool the smartphone but I will never lose my physical keyboard and of course I have now a smartphone with uh, with touch screen and everything already for years so it's um, you always uh, unexpected things will happen it is um, um, I do find it uh, yeah it's, it's it's quite a big ethical uh, there's quite a big of ethical uh, discussion around the, the development of Moving actual more and more into virtual into virtual worlds. So ready player one? Anyone who watched it? Few hands. Okay, so uh, if not, definitely uh, d definitely watch it. Where you really have this, um, uh, where you see the ethical dilemma of being kind of like addicted to a a virtual world instead of actually uh, enjoying or your uh, your actual uh, actual world as well. So, uh, um, but we should really look at hey, what are what are ways how we can really uh, use this virtual world to our benefits? For example, with um, we're now uh, building a quite big consortium with many Dutch hospitals to build a kind of digital twin of a hospital where place and time unrelated. You can go in there, do a simulation, uh, ping up your colleagues, say, "Hey, let's let's uh, yesterday that surgery." Let's do it one, one more time. It didn't feel comfortable. Uh, let's practice it one more time. And then we're really using this, this virtual world to our benefit. People get really addicted to it and move away from the actual world and actual interaction as well. That, uh, um, that would be definitely a pity. Yeah, so that's uh, one big advantage, but also one big disadvantage that you just named. Uh, I see two questions here in the back. Uh, Amea, do you want to go first? Uh, this is in relation to the Ready Player One reference that was just made. Uh, basically, uh, there are already a lot of concerns with the data handling, and now when you talk of a company, you know, uh, where you basically in a Ready Player One situation where you spend about 20 hours of your life in a virtual world. So, what do you think is the ethical consequence of putting so much of your life in the hands of one company? So, basically, in the Ready Player One reference, I think the OSS company. So, basically, say a meta company. What are the concerns and what are the ethical? Consequences. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think here's a cheap comparison, and it's the first one that comes immediately to mind, is thinking of mining towns. So in the US and in Western Australia and things like this, you had, you had these towns where People worked for the, the mining corporation. The mining corporation owned all the houses. The mining corporation owned the store that they would go to for all of the food. They would own the ways that you could get in and out of town without walking. So what happened? People's lives fucking sucked. <laughs> like, 
Basically, because they control everything, they control everything. So I, I, I think there's a kind of version of something worrisome like that maybe lurking. Now, that's absolutely catastrophic, uh, catastrophic thinking as well. I don't think it's very likely to happen, partially because of the kind of fragmentation things that we that I pointed out with the history stuff and I suspect is lurking behind a lot of these things. But I, I think that's a big worry there. Right? Okay, great. Thank you for your interesting uh, answer. Then we have another question right here. Um, yeah, I think all three of you mentioned something along the lines of via streaming or virtual reality, we can do things regardless of time and place. Um, at the same time, I think this, this uh, disconnect from time and place, from, from chronotopes, so to speak, um, is also the reason behind a lot of stress that we experience today. We are always online, we are always working, we always have to be uh, available to everybody. Uh, how do you guys see this developing when we start looking for more things to do regardless of time and space? So for example, a training uh, at your work, uh, you know, great that you can do an operation from your daughter's wedding, but maybe you want to say, fuck that, I at my daughter's wedding. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, uh, George, if you could comment on that. <laughs> well, not about the wedding sp uh, specifically, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I Maybe really regarding the streaming. Don't operate on somebody's heart when you're at your daughter's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty unambiguous. Um, so, but um, so, but so, what, so you're saying that we're we're being we're we're stretched too thin, and that uh, virtual reality is going to stretch us even thinner, or it will. Yes, yeah, I mean, in general. Yeah, I mean, I can I can see that. I mean. I don't know. What, what I thought of about, you know, is that historically, every time there's some sort of new medium, there are always these complaints or, or worries that things are going to happen. Like, I believe when radio came out, they were worried that, you know, people wouldn't think for themselves anymore. They would just listen to the radio. And the radio would be this, like, subversive tool that would make you think um, according to a certain way. And, of course, we know that's not how things turned out. Um, so I think with a lot of new technologies, there's a lot of... Um, yeah, there's a lot of worry and anxiety, and maybe we should um, let them see a little bit more, especially with virtual reality, you know, see a little bit more about what it can offer. I mean, when I, when I saw uh, Robert's presentation, I think the thing about the training looks super cool. Uh, the idea that you can use virtual reality to, uh, to do that, that seems like a big win. I mean, you know, how much, you know, to, to help, you know, training doctors and stuff like that. Um, so... That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, yeah. Okay, very cool. Thank you very much. Um, is there a question from the audience? Uh, otherwise, I will ask a question myself. Um, oh, the question regarding uh, the change of the perception of time. certain uh, social, um, how to say, behavioral uh, ethic code or something like that, both in the gaming community and both in reality. And when if we mix it, uh, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be a little bit uh, more uh, troublesome? For example, would it cause some behavioral anomalies between people? For example, let's uh, consider games as the Wild West. And let's consider society as a more regulated uh, behavioral structure. So what, what do you think about this? Uh, Nathan, yes. Yeah, uh, cool. I think that's interesting. So yeah, I'm trying to think of, of good examples where this happened. I think arguably stuff like Ultima Online, which I know is definitely older than everyone, almost everyone in the audience, um, Ultima Online, is a really fun example because it was basically like Minecraft, but sort of three quarters down. And there weren't really any kind of rules about what happened. So it very quickly became just grief central, right? Mm -hmm. People would wait for the point where people spawn in and just immediately murder them and take all their stuff. And then when they spawned in, murder them again. Um, eventually, an interesting little thing, kind of codes of ethics did develop. 
imposed internally. But that, that's just a fun example. I, I think kind of stepping back and thinking about the contrast between how we ought to behave in neat space versus how we ought to behave in these virtual spaces and things is hard. But arguably, right, there's a kind of golden rule lurking here, which is just, just don't be a dick, right? And, and that should apply regardless of whether we're playing around in VR or whether we're you know, walking around in neat space. So yeah, there is something really interesting about how exactly to figure out the, the ethics and, and how to slide back and forth there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then maybe a short answer from um, each of you. Um, how will our privacy be affected by the move from the physical to the online world? Not only virtual reality, but also in the streaming world. Um, yeah, well, um, well, in Europe right now, so there's the Digital Services Act um, and the yeah, I mean, very soon there's going to be a lot more regulation on what platforms can do with your data. Um, and so, um, yeah, um, y you know, so I think for a lot of privacy, well, so, you know, a, a lot of, obviously a lot of like um, uh, information was given out. Um, you know, there was sort of a, there was less regulation, let's say, of, of these giant platforms like uh, Facebook and, and Amazon. And that seems like now that's going to change, that there's going to be more uh, regulation there. So for example, in the area that I work in, in like um, recommender systems, um, you know, companies are going to have to say how they, like the parameters they use to determine which things are recommended to you. There'll have to be more transparency and there'll have to be an algorithm audit so, yeah, I mean, uh, I see sort of that uh, people will be regaining some of that privacy lost um, in, uh, shortly. So you're saying we kind of lost it in the past few years, but we're back on track to, to a better uh, privacy system in the uh, new reality. Yeah. Okay, uh, Robert, your view on this? Yeah, I think it's, it's always evolving. So in the beginning, it's good that there's not too much regulation because else innovations will never, never see the light of, uh, light of day. Um, with us as well, um, when we started with VR and healthcare, it wasn't a considered as a medical device yet. So it was just quick game, uh, game development nerds uh, together, us together, um, they built it, we sold it, and, uh, and we grew a business. And with that, we got a bit of money and a bit of more understanding. And then suddenly they talk about CE certification, medical device regulation, like, okay. Yeah, probably we're now big enough to, to handle that and to make some steps in that. So I think in the end it's good that in early days there is a bit of a free, uh, free open space to get really good innovations that they see the light of day. And then um, institutions, governments catch up with, with the latest developments and, and adjust policies to it. Okay, could you please take one step <laughs> forward? Yeah, perfect. Uh, cool. So I actually think this, this kind of comes back to your, the, your man with the hats question about exactly how we're going to present ourselves sort of all the time. I think basically the short answer is we really have to re-understand what it means for private, like privacy. We have to have a fundamental rethink about what that notion is, which isn't that weird. I mean, we did it once or twice already thinking about the ways that various technology and technological innovations impact the notion of privacy. So yeah, I, I think... We're going to have a new, a new conception. I think agree very much with both of the previous speakers that, yeah, we're maybe going to get a little bit better, but we're going to have to rethink things. Okay, so regarding the privacy, there's a general consensus uh, that there's still improvements, but uh, we've come quite a way already. Um, then lastly, would you say a new reality uh, regarding streaming, regarding virtual reality uh, or the extended reality? Uh, would you say it's a sustainable future for us? Because it, kind of a big question, but it is the way we're going. Uh, it does not seem to halt at the moment. What are your views on this? I definitely see it uh, as a sustainable future, else uh, I could stop with our company. I should better start, stop with it today. Um, and, but indeed, there's just things that we need to yeah, uh, uh, keep track of, and that is indeed uh, governments need to step up with understanding this, these type of new technologies. Uh, consumers and users need to step up and, and have a thought around what, what needs privacy for you. 
Um, and I think it's at least a really good development that several major tech companies are investing in this. It's not, it's not only Meta, Facebook, but uh, basically every big tech company is investing in this technology. So you get distribution of this technology as well. It's not that it's a need like in Ready Player One with Oasis, everything sent like within one company. Then it will definitely get, uh, uh, then it will get very dangerous. But as long as you have this, this distribution and no one owns it, and in the end, you own your data and your avatar, and it is you who make certain decisions with proper uh, rules and regulations following it, um, I definitely see a huge uh, sustainable future for it. That's very interesting. You're talking about uh, more decentralization. Maybe that's a bit too specific to get into right now, but uh, uh, Nathan, you have a view on this as well? Well, yeah, actually, I think, so So there's a, there's a kind of sustainability that we haven't really talked about with tech stuff that doesn't tend to come up, which is environmental sustainability. And actually, I think there's a really powerful argument for something like this decentralization that's really driven by environmental concerns. So uh, I'm part of an of AR and VR consortium in Glasgow. And one of the big things we're trying to do is to push office workers, instead of having their own computer systems and like three monitors set up, you have one set of glasses and you have literally wall-to-wall -wall computer space now and you can space things out. And you do like something like kind of games as service where you're running your various programs off of central bank. It's much more environmentally sustainable. That's incredibly good. And that's something that doesn't come up a lot with talks about VR and AR. Because a lot of, at least my initial thing is like, cool, it's nice to solve these problems with tech, but that's more batteries, right? That's more environmentally bad stuff. But actually, in the, it, when we kind of cost it out, it turns out to be better, which is super weird and cool. That's super cool. Uh, since I got the uh, Oculus Go, I actually uh, download, actually bought in the uh, Oculus Store the uh, uh, virtual desktop app. And I can just lay in bed with my lights off and do some work. Um, not that that's a very productive way of doing work, but uh, uh, yeah, you could just uh, work from anywhere. If you're in a busy environment or either work from home, that's all good. Uh, I just kind of missed the joke, I think. <laughs> uh, George, do you have an opinion on the sustainability or would you say? Well, I guess I, one thing that's sort of um, interesting in the Netherlands is uh, that it's um, with these data, so the Netherlands is like the data center location of choice for Facebook and Microsoft and all that stuff. And yeah, so when you, I mean, that that has an environmental impact of all these servers running and all that stuff. So at least from, you know, um, the sort of streaming business model may, um, yeah, may not, I, I, you know, may not be that good actually for the environment of a system where, you know, there's one, you know, that we, um, this sort of system uh, that we have where everything is stored, you know, there and we, you know, um, we're streaming it. So I, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, maybe indeed. But I, I, I agree that the environment is certainly something that, um, yeah, that you have to consider. Well, let's hope uh, the data storage and that kind of stuff gets more efficient because uh, indeed what, what you mentioned is a big problem. Um, do we have one more short question from the audience? I'll run up to you. Um, I'm not really sure how short it is, though, but uh, you, you, you guys determine how, how, how long the answer is going to be. Um, we have been talking a lot about uh, virtual reality, about creating an entire re entirely new reality. Um, but I was wondering um, what you guys think is the, the future of augmented reality. Will we be walking around with glasses that augment what we're looking at, um, give uh, like all tree blossoms so that the world looks more pretty, like are we prettifying things, but still staying within our own reality or is virtual reality going to be way bigger? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, in the end you will, uh, you don't need to choose. There will become headsets where as you just, your example, they you think, okay, I need some uh, time away from my colleagues completely uh, put my glass in virtual reality mode, I'm, I'm closed off and I have my five screens open, I'm doing my hardcore coding or writing this paper and full focus mode. Or hey, I'm a bit more social mode, I uh, put a bit more transparent, see my colleagues and we're actually, we're looking at this, I know 3D model together and we're actually collaborating with each other. So I don't think on, on that area, now it's really, you have separate hardware for either mixed reality, augmented virtual reality. Um, now, but you're getting more and more, it's now super high-end, but for example, Vario, you might know a Finnish company who has an XR headset, 
where you basically can choose different uh, different modes. And I think that is, uh, I think the most feasible option where uh, where we're going towards how it will exactly look. Maybe it's uh, it will go more and more towards glasses. Maybe certain more into a lens that you put uh, that you put in. Who uh, who knows? Uh, Musk is working on chips in your brain. Uh, <laughs> there are a link. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's right. And with that, unfortunately. I do need to yep. uh, leave. It was a bit last moment uh, when I got uh, asked. It was super cool to be here, but I need to catch a train almost. Yeah, we are, we, so are gonna, uh, we are going to round off. Thanks uh, uh, for having me. Please here. thank you, uh, George, Nathan, and Robert, uh, for contributing to the symposium. Uh, I have one more short little quiz, but I want to end it here uh, because Robert has a train to catch. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>
that kind of spectrum. Then the next question is, what was the most interesting topic you heard about? What did you learn today? And answer something, and I might um, ask you why you answered it. So uh, I'm curious. No, I started that. I said work, but uh, learns this fight as well. <laughs> VR in the healthcare, one mind. Yeah, the one mind Mario was uh, interesting. Um, I had a question myself. Um, I was wondering, what if someone just wants to meme? They just keep pressing the option button, and th th that's an option as well, right? Yeah, that's really funny. Um, is that Lewis works in bed? Okay. <laughs> VR for training purposes, medical VR, just in TV. Still a long way to go. Who uh, got the idea that we still have a long way to go after the symposium? Wallace, you had the idea? That we still have a long way to go? Oh, okay, you do agree. <laughs> um, VR for training purposes, there's a big uh, Nathan fan group. <laughs> <laughs> First phone streaming, what Lewis does a bit, very cool. Um, so, so I think um, besides the part that I talked about wearing my headset in bed, um, th there's some really cool uh, topics that we discussed today. Um, and um, by that, we are going to go to the last slide. I want to thank you all for joining uh, today's and the annual 2022 Flow Symposium regarding a new reality. Um, I want to thank the uh, Symposium Committee. Um, I'm standing here by myself, but I didn't organize it by myself. Um, so, and I want to thank Studium Generale, uh, Hannah especially, uh, for contributing to the symposium and uh, Mind Labs for sponsoring today's symposium. We're going to have a drinks in Esplanade next to here. Um, you're all going to get a voucher for a drink and there's some snacks. Uh, we can talk about the upcoming topics um, and the stuff we discussed. Or you can have an informal talk about uh, how your day was and uh, whatever, what you're going to do tonight. Thank you all. Thank you.